growth of the cities, ethnic hatred, and differences between U.S. and Europe. We're going to have the presentation, and then the professor is going to take your questions. I want it. I'm sorry, perhaps I was wrong, but so we're going to sh uh, start straight away. Uh, both because of the, the remarkable venue, which has such a tremendous history of being a, a place where smart people got together and, and talked about ideas, but, but also because of the tremendous human capital that assembled here. And I think the very existence of this festival serves as a stark rebuke against those who think that technology has made the value of face-to-face -face contact obsolete. Because after all, if you thought it was so easy to, to get things electronically, you could just download my papers and download everyone else's papers, but somehow or other we all really value being next to each other in, in this dense uh, historic urban area. I'm going to uh, do three things today. I'm going to talk about three p bodies of work. The first is going to be some general observations about cities, and this is work that uh, should be um, it will be forthcoming in a, in a book that uh, will be out next, next year, and it reflects a number of papers that I've written over the last 20 years. Uh, then I'm going to, okay, uh, then I'm going to talk about a book uh, that's downstairs, actually, that I published several years ago. The La Terza edition is downstairs, uh, called Fighting Poverty in the U.S. and Europe, and I'm just going to give you a little taste of that. And then I'm going to talk, since this is, after all, a conference about ethnic identity, I'm going to talk about hatred, particularly ethnic hatred, and its formation. And uh, I think if there's a, a core observation to that, it is that while human beings have an enormous capacity to love some people and, and hate others, all of that capacity can be affected by people outside them. So hatred is something that's actually created, and it's created by a, in a market, and that the tools of economics are uniquely well positioned to make us understand when, why hatreds come about and why they, why they disappeared. But I'll get to that towards the end of the talk. Let me start with a central paradox. The central paradox is that we live in an age in which transportation costs, communication costs have made distance almost irrelevant for many of the things that we do. Right? We can email across continents, we can surf the web uh, of every culture known to man, our telephone calls are cheap when you know, once they were enormously expensive, and yet despite the, this death of distance, despite the ability to connect across oceans and continents, cities are more vital than ever. We see this vitality in rising population, in rising incomes, in rising housing prices. Uh, I'll just show you, this is, the, this is the correlation between urban density and gross metropolitan product across areas within the U.S. It is an enormously tight fit. This is the relationship between urbanization and GDP across countries in the world. The connection between wealth, between prosperity and cities is, is almost perfect. I'm not claiming that cities cause that poverty, but, it is but they are intrinsically bound together with the process of, of getting wealthy. And certainly if you go to the developing world, you will be struck by the enormous difference between the cities, which certainly still contain a horrendous poverty and horrendous lack of infrastructure, but at least they point towards the future. At least they point towards a better world where, in fact, the people of the developing world are connected to the people of the developed world, whereas there's no future in, in rural poverty. Um, the, um, the, the reason why, of course, this is a puzzle is that cities are fundamentally the absence of physical space between people and firms. Cities are density, proximity, closeness. They exist to connect us. They exist to help us be close to one another. That's, that's what they're about. And yet, um, despite this, and despite the tremendous downturn that cities experienced throughout much of the second half of the 20th century, that demand for that proximity is, is remarkably robust. The explanation, the hypothesis for I'm, that I'm going to try and persuade you of for this fact is that um, what globalization and new technologies have done is to increase the returns to being smart. We have now 20 years of evidence showing the remarkable connection between globalization, new technologies, and the rise in returns to skill. We see this in a steepening of the, of the earnings education profile. We see this as a widening of earnings inequality within education groups. Skills, knowledge are more valuable than ever. Human beings are fundamentally a social species. We get smart from hanging out with smart people. We get smart by learning from each other. This is how the universities that all of us have some connection to function. 
right? If, if this was not, this was irrelevant, then we would just learn from books. There would be no need to congregate people together. And, and obviously, as, as anyone who teaches knows, the real function so often of our universities is not to permit teaching from the professor to the students, but to permit the students to learn from each other, to permit those peer interactions which are so valuable for the creation of human capital to function. Now, uh, cities are universities writ large. They're somewhat more practical than universities are somewhat less targeted towards the teaching phenomenon, but they are also forges of human capital. They are also engines of innovation. They are places where you go as a young worker and you interact with other workers and you learn within your firms or you hop from firm to firm and you acquire skills. And as you go, I mean, we see this in the age earnings profiles, which are significantly steeper in urban areas than outside them. It isn't that workers who come to urban areas suddenly earn a great deal more. What happens is that they come and their wage growth is faster and then if they leave the urban area they take the gains with them but they stop uh, experiencing faster wage growth. They stop experiencing uh, the gains and this is true at the humblest level. After all when Alfred Marshall said that in dense agglomerations the mysteries of the trade become no mystery but are, as it were, in the air. He was talking about artisans in industrial England. But it is certainly true at the highest level where we think that smart people in Silicon Valley are coming up with new ideas because they aren't in isolation, because they are learning from one, one another. Um, this is uh, the basic business of places like London and New York and Bangalore. They're places where, which are fundamentally about making ideas. The same density that once served to get hogsheads onto clipper ships, I'll let the translator struggle with that, uh, to get hogsheads onto clipper ships now serves to connect smart people who learn, who learn from one another. Uh, Bangalore as well I is about the, the transmission of information. In Bangalore, you see young people come, they'll work for Yahoo India. They'll acquire some knowledge about how the American computer industry works and then, you know, they'll start their own internet startup. They'll start their, their own search engine or a search aggregator. And again, it's about local knowledge that they acquired. And yes, they can connect with the, with the first world, but in fact, it's cities that enable them to learn the things that make those connections valuable. Um, in some sense, I'm arguing that the same death of distance that killed off the goods producing cities of the, of the first world, that made Detroit obsolete, are the same things that helped London and New York and Milan come back. That the same death of distance that was terrible for the pl places that had gotten out of the idea business and were just trying to produce a basic product as cheaply as possible. That those, that those things were killed off by the globalization, but that same globalization increased the demand. Um, let me... Um, let me start with, a, let me then now give you a little bit of a broader history on this. Cities have always been in the business of making people smarter. Cities have always been in the business of teaching, of teaching one another. Um, but that isn't, wasn't their fundamental purpose. The older cities of, of Europe and of the U.S. began either as political capitals uh, or as commercial cities. So quintessential commercial city would be Bruges, for example, or in the U.S., New York City. Rome or Milan, of course, were, were political cities based around uh, either emperors or, or various forms of, of bishops. Um, as the non-political cities grew, they were in the, in the business of trading mankind's basic commodities, either food or clothing. Clothing, with the exception of certain spices, tended to be the more valuable per pound and the more portable. So that the bulk of older cities almost all owe their economic strength to trading in some form of, of clothes. Uh, Bruges, of course, was a wool city, so was Florence. Uh, uh, while we're at it. And, and even within these industries, of course, this was what the guilds were all about. Guilds were about managing the human capital flows within these older cities. Um, there were chains of ideas that came out of these, out of these urban areas. So uh, th it's harder to find a, a more clear chain of ideas than the innovators who gave us the pictorial renaissance in Florence, right? And this is a chain of ideas that begins with Brunelleschi, who figures out how linear perspective works, who moves it to his young friend Donatello, who brings it into low-relief sculpture, who then it transfers to their friend Masaccio, who puts it on the side of the wall of the Francacci Chapel, which then moves to his student Filippo Lippi, and then it makes possible a whole pictorial revolution where artists then use this innovation to create more, I more ideas. Each innovation builds on the next innovation by people who are close to one another. You could tell a similar story about oils and the Van Eycks in Bruges. 
right? There's a similar, there's a similar northern revolution going on at the same time. We can, of course, tell scores of stories about, about these, these types of innovations, music and Haydn and Mozart and Beethoven in, in, uh, in Vienna uh, two centuries later. Cities are also playing a major role, of course, in creating the connections, the flow of ideas, the, the agglomeration of, of talent that then push towards democracy. So we think about the urban revolutions that begin in the low countries and the highly urbanized wool-producing towns of Flanders and then moves through to Paris, to, to uh, Boston, to various, uh, various places where smart people connect with each other and are able to fundamentally defeat the powers of kings and feudal warlords through, through connection. And obviously a lot of that, of course, happened in, in Italy. Um, this is the long history. The, the, the closer history, at least from an American perspective, is simpler than this. So uh, let me just give you a little detour of Chicago so we get, we get our minds in the place of where cities were in the 1970s and think about them coming back. So the great creation of, of American history is about the creation of a transportation network. It's a, cre a transportation network that enables the wealth of the American hinterland to be exported towards the markets of the East Coast and Europe. It's an enormously expensive undertaking. It's an undertaking that is done as much by the state as it, as it is by private individuals. It is a network that is based on waterways uh, initially, but then gets augmented by, by rail. Cities are critical nodes along that watery network, along that transportation network. Cities are the critical elements that enable that network to, to form. They first of all work as centers of commerce and then they're places where industry then agglomerates around these centers of, of trade. Every one of the oldest American cities in 1900, every one of the 20 largest, from the oldest of Boston and New York to the youngest of Minneapolis, were on a waterway and generally on a place on a waterway that made sense on a place where the, the, you know, next to the waterfalls of St. Anthony's Falls, at the place where the river met the sea, in the case of Boston or, or New York. They were in places that were natural nodes, and those cities, and the merchants in those cities, were the true frontiersmen of America more than any cowboy toting around a, a Winchester 45, right? These are the guys who actually made, you know, made America, made America happen. Um, the, um, and they achieved amazing things. In, in 1816, the cost of moving goods 32 miles over land in America was higher than the cost of moving goods across the Atlantic, which of course is why waterways were so valuable, right? There was an incredible shrinkage of distance. These are the Chicago stockyards, the paradigmatic industry of Chicago, the place where the bulls and originally the pigs came, came to, be, to be slaughtered. And this is the great industry that came out of this. So Chicago itself, is the creation of two canals, the Erie Canal, the older canal, and the Ir Illinois and Michigan Canal. Together, these canals create a great watery arc that goes from New York City through the Great Lakes, then cuts through at Chicago to the uh, Mississippi River, and then it flows into the Gulf of Mexico. Chicago is the linchpin on that arc. It is the place where the canal uh, hit, hit the lakes. It was obvious when the Illinois and Michigan Canal was being created, that Chicago was to, was to be a great city, and the speculators knew it in the 1830s. The existence of, of rail transportation only complemented that, that remarkable transportation edge. Once there was this transportation edge with the canals, with the rails, uh, then the city grew up around it. In the 19th century, the city was based on pedestrians. People walked to their jobs in the stockyards, and so slums clustered around these older transportation, transportation networks. The two great industries of the 19th century were the stockyards and by population the garment, the garment industry, cloth making, which was of course the dominant, continued to be the dominant industry in most, most older, older cities. Um, the, the thing that this made possible was a movement of the whole transportation, the, the whole location of American agriculture. So uh, the key was getting, you know, making Iowa feasible. So Iowa in 1870, what's my date here? Iowa in 1870 has about 50% higher land productivity than the older heartland of Kentucky, which was accessed with the Ohio River. By moving the production of corn from Kentucky to, Ohio, oh, to, um, to Iowa, enormous increases in productivity resulted. The key was, of course, getting Iowa corn in a financially workable way to the markets of the East. The old way of getting corn across markets, of course, was in the shape of whiskey, a very popular product in 19th century America, but there's only so much whiskey that even Americans could drink then. Uh, and in fact, the, the, the dominant way in which corn was moved was in porcine form, through pigs. Pigs, of course, are corn with feet. 
They're, they're you know, moved, moved cheaply. And then, of course, the beauty of pigs is that human beings, for some reason, Brazaula notwithstanding, are enormously fond of salted pig products, which are portable, and more so th of, than salted beef products. Uh, and as a result, pigs in the pre-refrigeration era were the dominant form of moving uh, corn across Cross land, and of course, those pigs were, were being slaughtered in those, in those stockyards. Later, once you have urban innovation and you have armor and swift creating refrigerated rail cars, then you had beef being slaughtered as well and shipped in refrigerated form across states. And that's what, that's what these guys are doing. Of course, Chicago at the same time was creating innovations. Chicago was the city that gave the world the skyscraper, meaning the tall building with a steel load bearing skeleton, right? There's a great architectural debate about who is responsible for the skyscraper. Is it Lewis Sullivan? Is it William LeBaron Jenny? And of course, this debate misses the point. It was a collaborative innovation. It was an innovation that starts in LeBaron Le Jenny's workshop. It goes to his apprentices, who had names like Burnham and Sullivan, and they all collectively riff on each other. They challenge each other. They learn from one another, and no one building is the breakthrough. One smart person learns from each, each person, and together they create this innovation that totally changes the shape uh, of our cities. Um, the, um, so you have these cities that are built around rail and built around water, waterways, and then the 20th century happens. And the, the great curse of the 20th century is that these cities got so good at innovating that they figured out how to innovate in a way that basically drove transportation costs down to nothing. Okay, and this is both innovations in the rail sector, where what you're looking at here is the real cost in moving a ton a mile by rail within the U.S., and what that is is a 90% decline. So whereas distance was tyranny in 1900, distance is largely irrelevant by, by 2000. At the same time, of course, the good people of Detroit in 1900 figured out how to make a perfectly pleasant German invention of the automobile cheap and affordable for the masses. Uh, and of course, with cars becoming massively affordable, the whole system of cities needed to be reworked around, around cars, just as older cities had been reworked around earlier forms of mass transportation, like the, like the omnibus. Um, but cars come along, and unsurprisingly, Americans then move. So all of this older type of city, walking or public transportation around rail yards and ports, becomes essentially obsolete. You, people are free to move to areas where they want to live, rather than in places that have an innate productive advantage because of waterways. We see this most strikingly in the enormous ability of warmth to predict success. There is no variable that better predicts which Americans grew, American cities grew in the 20th century than median January temperature. And that's what you're looking at right now. Warmth is enormously predictive. And this is true in every country for which we have data over the last 30 years. That in fact, warm places have done remarkably well relative to, uh, to cold places. In some part, this is the freeing up of people from having to locate around the Great Lakes. But it's also, shall we call it, um, you know, te temperature bias technological change. That in fact, we had a variety of things like the air conditioner, like improvements in dealing with, with public health. Uh, issues like cholera that made it easier to live in high temperature, high temperature places. And of course, this is the relationship between density and growth across American cities. And this is the response to the automobile, that places that were built at ultra high densities were ill suited for the car. And in some cases, enormous engineering efforts were undertaken to retrofit places like New York or Boston for the automobile. But in fact, it's just a lot easier to start with green fields and you know, you got Houston, just build the whole city around the car. Just do the whole darn thing with automobiles and make it big with a lot of highways, right? This is what car-based lo living looks like. It's efficient along lots of ways. While, you know, I mean, the average commute by car in, in the U.S. is 24 minutes. The average commute by public transportation is 48 minutes. It's an enormous time saving. On the other hand, there are, you know, some may say catastrophic, but anyone would say difficult environmental uh, costs that come, that come from this as well. And I'll, I'll, turn, to those, I'll turn to those later. Um, but despite the fact that in the 1970s, every one of America's older, colder cities, and many of them in Europe, looked as if they were headed for the trash heap of history, this did not happen. New York didn't die. Boston didn't die. London didn't die. Milan didn't die. All of these older industrial cities that looked like they had no future, because after all, you could always make goods cheaper in, in China, uh, they, they, didn't, they didn't die. And um, the... the 
they were in trouble, of course, because all of those transportation cost related advantages, those access to waterways, the, the fact that you were proximate to the rail yards, all of that stuff became irrelevant by 1975. And as a result, manufacturing left and you had these manufacturing cities that were hulls of their former self. And Boston looked no better than Buffalo. New York looked no better than Detroit during this time period. Now, what happened in some cities, and it's easy to explain which cities managed to reinvent themselves and which ones did not. In fact, there's one variable which does a remarkably good job of explaining it. But the cities that rebuilt themselves did so by exploiting the traditional urban advantage of creating chains of innovation. It's just historically the chains of innovation in 15th century Florence, they were a side product of a city that was about banking and wool. They weren't the main event, no matter how much we value those paintings today. Over the last 40 years in New York, finance, the chain of ideas in finance, which both you know, made people enormously rich and also played a certain role in creating the modern, the modern crisis that we're living through, that chain of inven invention was not a sideshow. It was the main event. 40% of Manhattan's payroll is in finance and insurance. 28% was in securities and commodity contra contracts, a very narrow range of industries that were tied to this very knowledge-intensive, information-intensive sector of the economy. I tend to think of this as being, you know, just, just so you have some idea of where New York is coming from, a as late as the 1970s, the dominant industry in New York is still the garment trade, which comes off of New York's original role moving cotton in and out of the port and because there was a ready built-in customer base in, in the sailors that were coming in, in New York. So the garment trade was the dominant industry through the 60s and 70s. It collapsed incredibly quickly. When I, was a, when I was a kid growing up in New York, leaving New York in 1975, an incredible crisis. The two other industries that New York had that dominated in the, 20, in the 19th century were sugar refining, uh, which again comes out of transportation, sugar coming up from the, the Caribbean, and you couldn't refine at that point in time in the Caribbean because sugar crystals coalesce during a long voyage trip. And of course, the book publishing industry. New York's advantage in book publishing uh, was that the city was great at stealing the first copies of European, particularly English books, which came across the, the, the pond that in the, in the 19th century, of course, Americans didn't respect anyone's property rights, and, and a big push as a, as a publisher was to get the book first and bring it out. Since New York was the foremost port and the b boats got there first, New York publishers had, it, had an advantage, and this is particularly true of the famous Harper brothers who beat out their, their Philadelphia competitors through this. Okay, New York always had finance. Again, it came out of the port. But starting in the 50s and 60s, there becomes this chain of quantifying, of quantifying finance. It starts, some might argue, it starts in the corridors of the University of Chicago in the 1950s when people like Harry Markowitz connects with Milton Friedman and Jimmy Savage and they start thinking about the trade-off between risk and return. These ideas then get moved to Wall Street, embodied in people like Jack Trainer and Fisher and Fisher Black into an increasingly competent, sophisticated way about thinking about risk and return. By the 19, early 1970s, we have Michael Milken using these quantitative tools to think about high yield debt, junk bonds, and then sort of creating a revolution in finance around that. The existence of those junk bonds and the ability to think about risk and return then makes it possible for people like Henry Kravis to create a revolution that's based on leveraged buyouts, where access to ability to access markets and borrow when things are, are good bets manages to them to work a revolution in the American, American boardroom. Again, the ability to think about risk and return makes it possible for Lou Ranieri to create the mortgage-backed securities market, uh, which didn't turn out so well right now. But it's, uh, uh, and of course, the, you know, another link in the chain would be, say, Michael Bloomberg selling the data terminals that then create the sophisticated work of data that enables people to, to think about, about risk, and risk and return. Michael Bloomberg also shows an incredibly important thing about older cities like uh, New York, which is the importance of diversity, right? Michael Bloomberg is a hybrid. Bloomberg, Bloomberg Communications is a hybrid industry, combining high tech with finance. And it is striking that Bloomberg didn't come out of the high tech cluster, okay? When surely they would have had better access to both hardware and software. But Michael Bloomberg came out of New York City because he knew what the traders wanted because he had run the trading floor at Solomon Brothers. And because of that local knowledge, he was able to innovate in a way that made him, uh, made him a billionaire. Um, we, um, we see this, we see the remarkable importance of skilled cities in lots of different ways. And I, I claim that one variable predicts which cities are able to come back and, one, and which ones didn't. And that variable is skills. For lack of a more sophisticated alternative, we'll just use the share of the population with college degrees as of 1970 or 60 or choose some earlier date going back to 1880. But it does a remarkable job at predicting which, one, which ones of American cities have done well. This is the relationship between income growth 
and the initial skills of the city in 1980. Okay, remarkably robust correlation. Uh, that's true. This is the relationship among older, colder cities between share of the population with college degrees in 1990 and population growth since then. Uh, uh, share of the population with college degrees is, after January temperature, the best, the most reliable predictor of, of urban success, although there are some caveats with that. And if you want to understand why Boston did well and Detroit did poorly, it turns out they're both on the regression line that in fact they're, neither one of them is a particular surprise. And there are plenty of examples of places apart from the East Coast, some of which you may not, may not know or even want to visit, that are skilled cities in the hinterland. I mean, the quintessential, that have managed to do well, the quintessential example being Minneapolis, uh, which is, is done remarkably well and has been remarkably skilled uh, as well, that, that cities managed to do well for these places. This is um, the, uh, the relationship between skills and income in a cross-section. What this is, is it's the relationship between the skill residual, which is your wage holding your skills constant. And what it shows is, a, is as the percentage of people with college degrees in your metropolitan area increases by 10%, it shows that your wages go up by 7% holding your skills constant. So as we increase the average skills in your area, you, you get paid more. And if the common interpretation, of course, in economics is that's reflections, reflecting something about your productivity as well. That may be about you as a person learning from them, or it may be that the entrepreneurs who employ you are also becoming more, uh, more productive as well. Um, and this has been accompanied by a uh, remarkably increased sorting of skilled people across space. So what you're looking at here is a 30-year phenomenon of the correlation between changes in po share of the population with college degrees and initial share of the percentage of the population with college degrees. So along the x-axis is the share of the population with college degrees in 1990. Along the y-axis is the growth between 1990 and 2000 in the share of the population with college degrees. The places that started with more skills have only become more skilled over time. And one interpretation here is that skilled people increasingly innovate in ways that employ other skilled people, whereas Henry Ford innovated in a way that employed thousands and thousands of unskilled workers, Bill Gates innovates primarily in a way that employs software uh, engineers. And Michael Bloomberg innovates in a way that, that, that employs lots of skilled people. Uh, a, a, a related fact, of course, is this fact back here. This has been tilting up over time very, very strongly. So the value of being around skilled workers has risen steadily over time. The work of Enrico Moretti has been particularly important in documenting this. Um, I've talked about this. As this is, of course, not just a U.S. phenomenon. This is true throughout Europe, that places like Milan, who were one-time industrial towns, have managed to reinvent themselves around, around being centers, uh, centers of ideas. I could tell a story about a chain of innovation in fashion that sounds in Milan that sounds very similar to the ones that we've talked about in other, in, in other industries. Uh, and, of course, Boston is a city. Boston, of course, is a city with no, uh, no comparative advantage other than cranberry bogs. I'll let the translator fight with that one, too. Uh, and as a result, Boston has had four centuries of trying to reinvent itself about smart people trying to figure out how to make uh, the city survive. Um, the, the role of cities in transmitting ideas is particularly important in the developing world. And this is, I mean, I think the, the key lesson in some sense that you should take from a book like Thomas Friedman's The World is Fat, Flat. So it is certainly true that people are able to do good software work in Bangalore and then sell it to Silicon Valley. Absolutely true. But the place that that software is happening is Bangalore, not somewhere in rural India. And the whole key is that Bangalore has the density of human capital, the density of knowledge, to make people productive, to make the young kid who starts working in Yahoo India learn enough to actually make him able to connect with the larger, uh, the larger world. Um, and this is, re this is really true throughout, uh, th throughout the developing world. Um, this is, of course, not a new phenomenon, right? If you go back to the glory that was Athens, right? Athens was a place that, because of its military victories in the fifth century, had been able to attract an astonishing uh, array of talent from the, the Greek civilization of the Mediterranean. They came in uh, because Athens was sort of the New York of its time, a dominant political and economic, economic player. And as these smart people connected with one another, they created these chains of innovation, right? I mean, there were people from outside of Athens who then taught Socrates and then starts off this chain of innovation in Florence. This is the chain of innovation that actually makes history Right, that actually are the people who, who give us the, the, the field of history, again, in, in drama and so forth. Again, it's sort of a connector of civilizations. Um, we can tell this story over and over again, right? So I, I, I like this guy. 
So this one's for my son, who, who's now closed his eyes in the front row. But uh, this, is, this, is, this guy is Jafar. Uh, and, and anyone who also has young children know that he's a very bad guy uh, from the Aladdin series. Now, in fact, Jafar is, is loosely based on the Conrad Weitz player, portrayal of Jafar in The Thief of Baghdad from 1940, who then connects back earlier with the figure of Jafar in the Arabian Nights, who is then ultimately the, the vizier of Caliph Harun al-Rashid during the glory days uh, of Baghdad. And far from being a bad guy, Jafar is in fact an enormously good guy, who is in fact one of the great supporters of the translation of outside knowledge into the house of wisdom in Baghdad and, and the bringing in of outside knowledge. Supposedly, he's the person who urged the people in Baghdad to study the Greeks when they had imported the Sintind, which is allegedly the Brahmagupta of Siddhanta, the collection of Indian mathematical knowledge. And that knowledge puzzled many of the Arab mathematicians uh, during its time. And allegedly, it was the vizier Jafar who then told them that they'd only make sense of this if they studied Euclid. I, I find this story completely implausible, but it, it's, it's still kind of a pleasant one. Uh, and, and certainly, Jafar was one of the great patrons of, of the House of Wisdom in Baghdad that served as a place for tremendous um, you know, uh, accumulation of knowledge throughout the continents. And then created guys like, this is Al-Khwarizmi over, over here, uh, who's the father of, of algebra. Uh, uh, and um, let's see what else I had, I had to say here. Uh, Jafar, by the way, was, was probably a Brahmin from Kashmir, bringing in, bringing in Indian, Indian knowledge uh, with him. Um, there's a, a, then a translation, of course, from Arab knowledge west through cities like Venice or Cordoba, uh, which again, just doing the same function that Bangalore plays today of transmitting knowledge. Again, not done to rural places. Globalization has never been a low density phenomenon. It's, it's a phenomenon that's centered in ports and places where ideas uh, move rapidly. Now, what happens, of course, when you have urban development in the developing world is that poverty becomes visible. These are the favelas of Rio, right, often seen as being an absolutely terrible place. But let me tell you, when you look at the data, the lives in the favelas of Rio are a heck of a lot better than the lives in northeastern Brazil by almost any measure, by measures of, you know, infant mortality, by measures of, of uh, life expectancy, by measures of poverty, by a long shot. And while the Dharavi slums in Mumbai look hard, these people are actually remarkably entrepreneurial. They're connected to a real economy. They're actually you know, accumulating skills, albeit in a way that looks like a difficult life by our incredibly privileged standards here. But uh, the cities are not the problem. The cities, the cities are the future. And, and indeed, uh, the people in these cities are coming there voluntarily. Right? They're not fools. They're not coming to these urban areas because they're making some great collaborative mistake. Right? In fact, you know, they're, they're getting a lot richer by doing so, and you know, they're choosing over and over again to, to, to come in. Um, and in general, I mean, sort of this is a primary point, because people choose cities, urban poverty should not be seen as a weakness of cities. It should be seen as a strength. And the fact that cities have been unequal for at least 2,500 years that we observe them is not some great failure of urban areas. It's because, in fact, cities are able to offer economic opportunity at both the high end and the low end. Of, of the income distribution. Uh, and in fact, it should make us more worried about the enforced homogeneity of, say, America's suburbs than, than we should about the incredible diversity and inequality in America's cities, because in fact, rich and poor are both finding things in, in those cities. Um, in places like Boston or New York, you have the, the ethnic networks that make things easier for immigrants. The fact that cities facilitate trade has for millennia made it possible for people with you know, physical labor but no capital to exchange labor for capital and to work collaboratively with people with capital but not enough, not enough labor. Um, so, and, and of course, today in cities, they play it, at least in, in the U.S. and in much of the rest of the world, you don't need cars there. Right? The American suburbs, these, this whole urban world that was built around the automobile, requires an enormous amount of expense to actually pay for the cars and to pay for the insurance and to pay for the gas and to pay for all of this other stuff, which is a lot of money if you're a relatively low-income immigrant coming to the U.S. You can get by if you're living in a, you know, in, a, in a small apartment somewhere in an older suburb that still has public transportation connections. And that's another thing that cities do well. This is, this is you know, it's, it's one of these interesting facts that actually when you build subway stops in the U.S., the areas get poorer around them, right? Which has been taken for some people as being evidence against the, the, the use of public transportation, which of course it isn't at all. It's evidence that these things actually cater to poorer Americans, and that's a perfectly, uh, a perfectly valid function for, for them to play. Um, okay. Um, let me just have a few, before I move on to the other sections of this talk, let me just talk a little bit about the policy implications of this. 
Um, the first thing is that while I couldn't believe more strongly in the importance of place for determining things about our lives, good things and bad things, um, saying that places matter does not mean that places should ever be seen as the ultimate goal of government policy. The ultimate goal of, policy, of government policy should always be to enrich and empower the lives of human beings, not to make one place prettier or seem to be more productive. Now, sometimes investing in places is a good way to get towards enriched and empowered human beings, but that, that, the fact that it is fundamentally not the end goal must never be forgotten. And too often, there are policies which are justified around making a place come back that would never pass muster in if you actually put it through a cost-benefit analysis that asked if this were helping people. The quintessential examples of this are infrastructure that are built, built in declining areas, both in the U.S. and in Europe, massive amounts spent on rail lines or public housing. Now, the distinguishing characteristic of poorer parts of, of, of declining areas is that they have too much infrastructure relative to people because, in fact, they were built during an earlier era in which demand was there, okay? And as demand disappears, the price of real estate disappears, the price of real estate declines, there's plenty of housing, but people remain there because housing, you know, is still valuable. Um, the last thing these places need is more housing, is for you to tear up their perfectly good housing stock and build new housing, housing models. And the last thing they need is often new forms of transportation networks. After all, I've just been arguing that the old stuff about moving goods is no longer particularly relevant. And you often have absurdities, like Detroit's many hundreds of millions of dollars spent on the people mover. That's an elevated rail line in Detroit that carries almost no people uh, and ri runs above streets that are empty, okay, in a city in which the average commute is less than 25 minutes, right? The last thing Detroit needs is a people mover, okay? And, and over and over again, we've seen things like light rail or trains which have been meant to revitalize urban areas. And in there's certainly a, a value of infrastructure where there is demand there. I'm not in any sense speaking against infrastructure, but thinking that you're somehow rather going to invest in a rail line in a place which already has fast transportation, that's going to make a difference, that's absurd. Um, there is somewhat more justification in Europe than there is for in the U.S. for engaging in smart regional policy, which usually means regional policy oriented around skills and building human capital rather than building physical capital, but there is somewhat more of a justification, in part because there's less land and in part because there's less temperature heterogeneity. So if you're Buffalo, New York, you face this enormous temperature challenge in coming back, which is just not true in Liverpool. It's just not true in, in Turin. It's just not, you know, whatever, whatever, choose your declining area within the European heartland. They don't start with, with two strikes against them. So there's somewhat more of a case. But on the other hand, since Europeans are more enthusiastic about large government projects than Americans are, there's even more potential for waste and stupidity. And, and I just, you know, I can't say how important it is to actually, you know, uh, put whatever projects you have through the cost-benefit analysis churn and don't get swayed by the magic of place. So as much as I do think places are magical, I also don't think that magic should confuse us about what good investments uh, are. Um, while I do believe that basically there is, you know, in fact, my own preference is for something like a level playing field, where cities are allowed to compete with each other and the government doesn't try to favor particular areas. Cities in many ways today don't actually face a level playing field, particularly in the U.S., in part because we've subsidized cars, in part because we failed to tax people for the emissions costs of, of their, their gasoline usage. Um, uh, a last thing I want to emphasize on cities, although I do have to, have to move on, is the importance of housing policy. To a first order approximation, the number of people in an area is proportional to the number of homes in that area. If you don't allow homes to be built, the area won't grow, okay? And what you're looking at across, across this graph is the relationship between price in 2005 on the, on the x-axis and, no, price is on the y-axis and building is on the, on the, on the y-axis. Okay, so what you're noticing is the places that build a lot in the U.S. are not expensive and the places that are expensive do not build a lot, okay? This graph is incompatible with the view that only demand drives what goes on in cities, okay? It's incompatible with the view that it's only about, uh, it's only about the, the presence of, of pleasant amenities or a, a great de a degree of economic vitality because if it were all about demand, this would be a ray coming out from the origin. This would be the places that were expensive would have a lot of building, and the places that were inexpensive would ha not have a lot of building. And there are places like that, of course. You see Youngstown, Ohio down there. That's a low-demand place. That has nothing to do with housing supply. That's just got low prices and low, and low building. I'm sorry, Youngstown. It's just true. Uh, but, you know, these places, Las Vegas is not short on demand. 
but it builds houses, and as a result, it grows enormously. And San Francisco is not short on demand, but it barely grows at all because it has enormous restrictions on building, which are not by primarily because of land availability, not at least during the natural land availability. This has very little to do with the actual land density. It's driven primarily by regulatory decisions about building. Um, and you see lots of, er, which, you have, the sea. You, you, you have the sea, but you have mass, no, you have massive amounts of land, just massive, right. massive, well, in, in, in and around, you know, Silicon Valley, you have massive amounts of land that's zoned. They have 60 acre minimum, minimum lot size in some area of Santa Clara County and in Marin County, 60 acre minimum lot size. Think about what that means. That's not an absence of land. That's a, that's land that has been made undevelopable by, uh, by these things. But you're, you're right. Certainly natural barriers like water also, uh, also matters. Um, okay, let me, let me, and of course in Europe, the big question for the cities is building up, is building, is building de novo. And it's an enormous challenge because the older cities of Europe are not just treasures for their own countries, but treasures for the world. On the other hand, if cities decide to freeze themselves in concrete, then they are not able to grow to adapt to provide affordable housing for ordinary people. And, you know, a place like Paris ends up being a boutique city f only for the wealthy rather than a place that's able to offer economic opportunity uh, for all. I just wanted to connect this to the recent crisis. What you're looking at is what Las Vegas looks like. So this is Las Vegas. This is making my point that Las Vegas is basically unfettered. So Las Vegas has built an extraordinary amount of housing. It's the fastest growing city in the U.S. in the 1990s. Um, until 2003, the dotted line is our estimate of real construction costs. The line above it is their prices, okay? Prices track construction costs almost exactly, as you would expect in a market where there are no barriers on supply. There are no regulations in an unincorporated Las Vegas wor worth worrying about. There's an infinite amount of land, and so you just build out, you build out forever, and the prices cost roughly construction, what construction costs do. As a result, you know, you'd always expect the prices to come, to come back to that. What you saw in 2003 was a remarkable divergence okay, between the prices and the construction costs. It's a brief bubble that exploded that seemed at the time utterly unfeasible. There were no limits that suddenly occurred. And what you've seen, if I carry this forward, is that we're basically back to where we once were. Again, an entirely predictable thing given the, the nature of this housing market in Las Vegas and, and Phoenix. Unfortunately, in places which, uh, where housing supply is constrained, like San Francisco or like New York, it's impossible to predict where housing prices will land. But I think it's, it's a pretty good bet that in the long run, Las Vegas and Phoenix and Atlanta and Dallas and Houston will look like their construction costs because they're going to be dictated by supply. All right. Uh, how am I doing on time? A little bit more. So uh, this guy is Henry David Thoreau. He's the patron saint of American environmentalism. He, write a, he wrote, he's a big fan of living out in the middle of the woods away from other people. These are the woods in which he, he lived in. On a uh, beautiful spring day in 1844, Thoreau and a friend of his went out into the woods to have a picnic. They were going to make some chowder. That's a soup. And uh, the, the flames from their chowder were, it was a dry day, the flames were spread. They went from the, the thing and they burned down both the local grass and then they burned down more than 300 acres of prime conquered woodlands. This American s environmentalist saint was one of the great destroyers of woodland during his time period and was hated by his neighbors for his lack of respect and care for the local environment. Okay, there is a lesson here. If you want to be good to the environment, stay away from it. Okay, <laughs> human beings are a remarkably productive, remarkably destructive species. Okay, there's no good that comes from surrounding yourself by Greenland if you want to preserve that Greenland. Get yourself into a big tall skyscraper and walk to work. Okay, um, and that's, that's the point of this, this p next paper that I'm going to talk briefly about. This is joint work with Matthew Kahn, uh, where we've actually estimated the carbon dioxide emissions associated with different types of living within the United States. And we've added up, this has been just uh, home and transportation, so we've added up gasoline uh, usage from private transportation. We've associated that with density and proximity to the urban center. And then we've added up the carbon emissions associated with home heating and with... Um, uh, and, and with, with electricity and cooling. And there have been a variety of technical details which you can find on, on our paper on the, on the website. Um, there are two facts that I want to illustrate. This is, um, this is a, a map of the metropolitan areas that we, that we show. Along the y-axis is just our estimate using numbers ba based vaguely on the Stern report of what the costs are uh, from carbon emissions in different places. And what you'll notice is by far the greenest places, those are the places over on the left-hand side, are all in coastal California. Okay, Los Angeles, San Francisco, San Jose, San Diego, and then Sacramento are by far the greenest parts of the country. Now, epsilon of that is, some small amount of that is the fact that they do have green appliances in California, and that's, and that's great. But the big part of this is just climate. 
It's just, you can just explain it with January and July temperatures. And the fact of the matter is that California has, by a long shot, the most temperate climate in the United States. Okay? The places over there are Oklahoma, Memphis, Houston, Dallas. Okay? They're really hot and they're really humid. And they use massive amounts of electricity there. They also drive ungodly distances. Okay? So the combination of enormously long distances of driving and, and uh, the humidity make these places just very, very energy, energy intensive. Okay? And the places of the East Coast are between the two. They use more home heating, they use a little less electricity, and they tend not to drive all that much. Oh, there is public transportation in here. Okay, what your, but what's on the y-axis? What's on the y-axis is the degree of local land use regulations, often created by, by uh, environmentalists themselves. This is a paradox. You would think that if environmentalists in California cared about the environment or cared about reducing global warming, they would be really big fans of development in their home areas because each house that's built in San Diego is one less house being built in suburban Las Vegas to a first order approximation, right? The rate of household formation in the U.S. is basically determining the rate of new homes that are being built. And there's basically a one for one substitution. So you can't turn off the spigot for development overall. You can just turn it off in your area and move it someplace else. You turn it off in a temperate place, it gets turned on in a place which has, which has a lot more humidity. And as a result, emissions go up. So you would think that environmentalists in California would be enormously eager to promote new housing, particularly high density housing, particularly uh, stuff around, you know, the, the, the San Francisco Bay has this phenomenal public transportation system, BART, which, you know, would be a great place to develop mass amounts of housing. So you would think that, like, the environmentalists would be a really, really gung-ho to promote development around San Francisco Bay. Of course, the opposite is the case. Of course, we have 40 years of things like the Save the Bay Association, then raising hurdle after hurdle, making, making things more difficult. And in some sense, it's not that I'm against environmental impact statements, such as those required in the famous Friends of Mammoth case uh, 35 years ago. Uh, it's that these environmental impact statements are fundamentally one-sided. They ask what the environmental impact is if the project goes through, but not what happens if it doesn't go through. They don't ask what's the impact if the project is built in, in Las Vegas or in Houston instead of built in, in California. And that's really, that's really what, you'd, what you'd want. The second point that I want to make is just we also did study suburb differences. And this is the kind of picture that you get. Um, the red area is basically where, uh, where Thoreau lived uh, out there. And this is the, the place which has the highest emissions. And then the green areas are the areas that are, that are dense. And this is coming from two things. It's coming from much lower amounts of driving at the urban core, but it's also coming because of high land and high housing prices induce people to buy smaller houses. And smaller houses mean less, less energy. Uh, I think the reason why this is important is not so much in static societies like Europe and the US, but in the developing world. And I think we all have an incredible stake that places like India and China build up rather than building out. And that you know, the fact that Mumbai has some of the most draconian land use regulations in the world that keep their city flat and ensure that people are driving incredibly long distances in, in traffic, that's madness. And in fact, you know, the key is to get people using elevators, which are a great form of public transportation, instead of using cars at long, at long distances. Um, I have hi, 15 minutes, plenty of, plenty of time to handle one book and one paper. OK, uh, I'll, I'll, I will be reasonably brief. The, the book that, as I said, that I'm promoting that's downstairs with Alicina is on trying to understand why the US doesn't have a European-style welfare state. Um, this is a, a graph of the share of GDP that's being spent on uh, social services between the EU and the United States from the 1870s uh, onward. I think 1870 is our, first, is our first year, then followed by 1937. Uh, the bar is the difference, and it's now up to about 10% of GDP. That, that was when last we checked. And uh, make no mistake that the election of Barack Obama will certainly close this to some certain degree, but the U.S. and Europe will still look extremely different in four or eight years uh, on, this, on this margin. The U.S. will, the US will still look f like it does a lot less in terms of taking care of its poor and will still have much less, much lower marginal uh, tax rates for rich people, at least in many European countries. Uh, one thing to notice here is that this is a, a post-World War I phenomenon. That the view that this was about, uh, the view that this was about the, the, the Bismarck set this whole thing in stage in the 1870s just isn't true. The government just, the European governments just didn't do enough in terms of pensions to make this, make this happen. You want to think of this as really being the U.S., being a, a 20th century post-World War I phenomenon, and then you really want to think of it taking off, say, in the, in the 60s and 70s, in the, po in the 70s and 80s. Okay, there are lots of failed theories to explain this, why the U.S. Has, has a different. Economics has done a wonderful job of generating a lot of theories that are just plain wrong. So one of the theories would suggest that Europe has inherently either more volatility or more income inequality than the U.S., and that, income, that 
redistribution in, the, in Europe, more redistribution is correcting for greater innate differences or more innate volatility. That, that's just nonsense. There's just no evidence whatsoever to suggest that that's the truth. There's another theory that certain people are very fond of, which is that America has a much more opportunity, meaning that equality when averaged out over enough years is, is large enough. Uh, that's also nonsense, right? The, uh, the probability of exiting out of the bottom quintile of the European income distribution is significantly higher than the probability of exiting out of the bottom quintile of the American in, income distribution. At the very top, there's a little bit more mobility in the U.S., but in terms of the bottom, uh, Europe is actually a more mobile society. Um, the, um, there's a tax efficiency argument, but that predicts that countries with better tax systems should have bigger governments. I think it's hard to argue that European tax systems, particularly here in Italy, are such models of worldwide efficiency that, that that's why they're being used, uh, used so aggressively. Um, here are two theories that do work. Um, and, and they each, by our statistical estimates, explain about one half of the Europe-US difference. The first one is political institutions. And there are lots of different, uh, we use proportional representation uh, as being just an, an example of, of these institutions. But we really mean that there are many of these things that go together. But Europe has a variety of institutions that are reliably correlated over a large number of at least more prosperous countries with having larger welfare states, proportional representation being one of them. But in general, the more that you move towards majoritarianism, the less redistribution that you have. The more that you have various checks and balances on what the act of government does, the more that you have, the more that you have a larger welfare state. Um, the U.S. has very right-wing institutions. The, the Europe has quite left-wing institutions. This explains about one half of the difference. Now, as I'll say in a minute, those things are themselves endogenous. And I think the key is to actually explain why those things occurred, uh, which is what we also we do. This is, um, and the second thing is racial and ethnic fragmentation. So this is the relation between a, 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 it's essentially a probability that two people chosen at random will be of the same racial or ethnic group in the city. But places, countries that are more fragmented have a lot less redistribution than others. And that's what I'm going to talk about in my, in my hatred paper when I, when I get to it. So basically, the, the US is greater heterogeneity of ethnicity explains about a half, and the, and the institutions explain about a half. Um, the, the, the racial effect is, of course, seen in lots of different data. There's work by Erza Lutmer that was published in the JP that shows that if you work around, if you live around poor people who are of the same race as you, you tend to be more favorable towards redistribution. If you live around people who are poor of a different race than you, you tend to be more hostile towards, towards redistribution. This is across states in 1990 when we still had states having had a lot of say about how much money to give in welfare payments. Um, what you see here is that there's a very strong correlation, even holding constant the income of the state between uh, the share of the state's population that's African American and the degree of, of redistribution. The more th the state is white, the more generous, uh, the more generous it was. Okay, so, so let's try and explain that the things that I'm going to talk about now are essentially trying to make sense of these two facts. Um, the first is I'm just going to talk briefly about the endogenous institutions. It's, it's a mistake to ever think of institutions as being fixed attributes. They're always built by people over time. They're all aspects of things that are, that are endogenous. And thinking that you know, the long run explanation of one area of success versus the others is institutions, I think, is always a mistake. In 1900 or 1890, choose your year, you would never have said that the US had more right-wing institutions than Europe. Okay? Europe still had kings, for goodness sakes. They had kings. They had empowered nobility. They had tons of checks on what popular people were elected doing anything. Okay? The US was a democratic country that had you know, widespread, uh, at least universal male suffrage outside of the Jim Crow South. Uh, it, it was certainly uh, among the most progressive in terms of its institutions, polities in the world. By 100 years later, that changed. It changed because the US didn't change. It changed because the US still has more or less a constitution that would be you know, recognizable to Henry Clay, if not to Alexander Hamilton, and probably would be recognizable to Hamilton as well. Germany's current constitution would make no sense to Otto von Bismarck. Right? It, would, it would look nothing like the constitution that he envisioned when he was, he was uniting uh, Germany. And I doubt that Cavour would be all that pleased with the way that Italy worked out either uh, in terms of, of the institutions that, that these countries now, now have. Um, and what happened, of course, is that Europe was challenged by two great wars uh, during which e these institutions were rewritten. The right was usually in command at the time of the war. The right lost. 
and there was a there was a massive change of, of authority then. Uh, Italy's story, of course, with proportional representation is typical, right? There were massive uprisings that then created this uh, this change. It was a move to the left at the time. It was then create, followed by a move to the right, again, in related to armed, uh, to, to massive uprisings. And then after the war, institutions were then rewritten again, often with social democrats playing a, a significant role, or even communists playing a significant role in some places in terms of writing these things. Proportional representation, a long-standing demand of socialists because it was felt that it empowered poorer people were, were quite free frequently part of these institutions, but the whole constitutions were written, uh, were written, were written together. Um, and you know, the UK, which has the most stable system, also had the least change over the over the 20th century as well. Um, these institutions uh, then show up, then uh, actually have interesting impacts on culture. One of the things that's really fascinating is the set that the U.S. and Europe both have sets of beliefs that go along with their welfare systems. So the average American, 54% uh, of Americans, look at just the bottom half, uh, believe that luck determines, sorry, 54% of Europeans believe that luck determines income. Only 30% of Americans believe that luck determines income. This is just the answer to this survey question. 60% of Americans believe that the poor are trapped. 29% of, sorry, 60% of Europeans believe that the poor are trapped. 29% of Americans believe that the poor are trapped. By contrast, 60% of Americans believe that the poor are lazy. 29% of Europeans believe that the poor are lazy. Now, of course, this runs counter to the fact that, that by normal work surveys, the American poor work a lot harder than the European poor do. Uh, so despite the, you know, the beliefs have very little to do with anything that resembles reality. Uh, but in fact, these are these very strong, these very strong beliefs. Um, the argument that we make in our book is that these beliefs are, like institutions, also endogenous. They're built up over time, and uh, the American beliefs have, long, have, have a long-standing part of the American, uh, American educational system. In fact, the California directions on te what teachers are supposed to do in the California school system, which is hardly a model of being particularly right-wing, one of the major objectives of, of social studies teachers is to teach children that America is the land of opportunity. Right, that's a long-standing objective. This is not unique to America, right? Uh, Napoleon III was very big on the, a series of books that kids were going to learn that taught them that if they kept their hands down and were loyal to their emperor, they, no end of rising that they could, that they could experience within their, their own countries. Um, in, in Germany, the Kaiser also you know, tried to use the schooling system very strongly, but they lost. They lost in a series of, in France, the education battles really started during, during the teens and then really were won in, in uh, the 20s after the aftermath of World War I, where the teachers' unions got to take over. And they taught a different ideology. And it's, you know, I'm not saying that either one is true. It's the last thing that I mean to suggest. But there, there are two rival ideologies, and what you should view this at is not any sort of a, uh, you know, Bayesian reflection of what reality is, but something that people are taught in, in schools and that they, that they learn about. And that's sort of a critical element to making sense of why, of how these two systems work. And in fact, if you regress the belief that the poor are lazy on hours worked for the poor, you get no correlation. If you regress it on proportional representation, it's like a perfect fit. So the, the political institutions do a great job of predicting what people believe about the nature of poverty, while uh, the actual nature of poverty doesn't do so well. Um, let me then, then move to the final paper that I'm going to talk about which is uh, this work on hatred, which attempts to create a formal, formal model which has something to do with the story that I just told, where beliefs are formed by people around them. And again, the basic structure of this paper, the basic structure of this agenda, is it, it attempts to sort of you know, combine economics and psychology in a way that uses what I think economists bring, to this, bring best to the table. So psychologists are best at teaching us what human beings are like. We're no good at playing amateur psychologists. It's not what we do. Human beings, you know, psychologists tell us that human beings are enormously sensitive to social cues, that we believe things that people around us tell, around us, tell us. These include, say, the famous Ash experiments where people believe that lines are longer when they're actually shorter when they're told, uh, when they're told so. Um, but what people are then taught is a matter of economics because, in fact, no psychologist could tell you why it was that socialist teachers won in, in Europe, whereas you know, right-wing teachers won in the US. That's a market phenomenon. So economists are the people who have to tell us about where the market for ideas goes, where the supply of beliefs come from, where the entrepreneurs of error show up and can persuade people things on one side of, of the equation or the other. Uh, and I wanted to show a particular example of this with this paper of mine on hatred, which was published in the Quarterly Journal of Economics in, 19, in 2005. 
So uh, hatred, I'm going to take a very economics def definition of it. Hatred can be defined pragmatically as the willingness to pay to inflict pain on others. Okay? It's a very economics definition. It's the willingness to forego your own well-being in order to make somebody else hurt. Okay? Um, it's, um, we can measure it with surveys, certainly. Um, and we know it when we see it, uh, I guess. We know it when people are blowing themselves up to inflict large pain if, on people around them. We know them in economics experiments. Let me see if I have a thing on this. Uh, I'll talk about that, that in a second. It's a little example of hatred shows up in the so-called ultimatum games. Uh, as we know, in ultimatum games, when the first, the first person gives an offer and gives an offer, say, that I get 90% and the other person gets 10%, those are always rejected. That is, by my definition, remember, an example of hatred especially if these are anonymous one-shot settings. The person who's given 10% is give, foregoing his or her benefit in order to inflict pain on that bad person who made such an unfair offer to begin with. Right? So put that in your mind, because I think that really gives you a sense, that sort of very understandable human emotion of what hatred is all about. Right? It's someone who has done, or we think will do, some harm to us in the past that we're willing to strike out against. It's perfectly natural. It's perfectly emotional. Most of us feel it every time we take to the highway and someone cuts us off in, a, in our road, right? It's, you feel the surge. There are, you know, there's a whole scientific uh, nexus of, of research on various forms of chemicals that then create, get created in our body that have that urge to punish people who, who uh, misbehave. Um, I, I like this line. She's actually a, Jaws here is actually a journalist, but she's writing about uh, psychological results. Hatred is a primitive emotion that marks for attack or avoidance those things which we perceive as a threat to our survival or reproduction. Um, now, hatred at the individual level is easy to understand. It's also easy to model, right? It's, it's a quite sensible thing that we human beings have the ability to punish people who, are, who behave badly towards ourselves. That, act, after all, keeps people honest. It makes people behave well towards us over, over, uh, over time. Um, what's interesting, of course, is the extent to which people are able to feel hatred towards groups that they've never had any contact with. Right? So we all know lots of stories of you know, little, little kids growing up in, in towns in Germany where they've never seen a Jew who are in the 1930s who are taught that Jews are, are some awful threat to their, their survival. Um, this, is not about, you know, this is not about experiencing some harm. It's about being taught about uh, some harm. Um, okay. Uh, the, um, and hatred is always and everywhere formed with stories of past and future atrocities, tales of African-Americans raping white girls in the South, tales of Jews killing Jesus. We, of course, are in the town of the famous Trent flood libel, uh, which, uh, as we know, set off, a, set off some killing of some, some Jews. Uh, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, of course, a story originally written by uh, the, Czars, uh, the Czar's secret agency, which then served as the, as the basis for a continuing libel against, uh, against Jews, which is still popular on TV programs in Egypt and other places. Often these stories need repetition more than truth. That was, of course, Joseph Goebbels' famous line on this. Okay, there's a model. The model is actually fairly simple. I just want to sort of sketch it to you to suggest that there is an underlying economic logic to it, although I would, I would urge you to read the, read the paper if you have any interest in this. There's a setting. Two pa parties are competing for votes. They're offering different amounts of redistribution. There are two subgroups within the population, a minority, which can be either rich or poor, and a majority, uh, which is the main group. The two parties have available a technology which can spread stories about the outgroup, about the small group. They can spread stories that the outgroup is potentially dangerous. <laughs> Voters can then investigate these stories. They don't automatically believe them. They follow Bayes' rule in what they do. Um, and after investigating, they then choose between the candidates. And then there's a bunch of stuff afterwards on whether or not that makes the investigation potentially rational. But the, the, the real point here is the second part isn't particularly necessary because if you think about people just making decisions at the voting booth, they have you know, no strong incentive to investigate anything since their votes don't particularly matter. This is, by the way, a, a major point for those of us who question whether or not behavioral economics should make us more enthusiastic about government action. Right? The trade-off between the state and the private individual is not about the errors of the private individual alone. It's about the trade-off between two different types of errors. And there's no reason to think that when people suddenly show up in the voting booth that they become paragons of rationality. As we know, the majority of people in Weimar, in you know, the Weimar Germany where my father was born, the majority of people voted either for the communists or for the Nazis. Right? This doesn't look to me as if the voting booth suddenly purges all sins of irrationality. And I think this is very important when we think about, you know, behavioral economics and what irrationality means for what the government should do. Um, okay. Um, 
key comparative static. So there are a bunch of different, different stories that come about. Uh, I'm going to just skip over, over these things. Um, here's sort of the key things that I want, to, I want to get across. Hatred is more likely when the group is relevant along the policy-relevant dimension. So if the two parties split along something in which the outgroup is relevant, then hatred will be spread. If the two parties agree upon things in which the outgroup is relevant, then no one's going to bother to hate them because there's no political gain from it. Again, this is economics, not psychology. It's a question of what are the incentives for the suppliers of error. And this, of course, hatred is in this case completely erroneous. Uh, the right is going to push hatred against poor minorities. The, the, the left is going to ha push hatred against rich minorities. And we certainly have an abundance of examples throughout history where, the, where both types of things have, have occurred. Um, more extremism is going to occur on the issue that the outgroup is different on. Uh, that's going to lead to more hatred. Um, often hatred is beaten not with love, but by villainizing the haters. So this is, this is sort of a very classic technique that you, you know, build hatred against the, the people in the American South who are the bulwarks of the Jim Crow of, of apartheid system. Um, and policies relating to migration or segregation are going to really stoke the fires of hatred. Once you've got migration policies on the table, then somebody's going to be telling you that those immigrants are awful. And that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty darn predictable. Um, okay, let me just tell you two stories and then I'll fix here. Um, uh, this is a story that's based on a great American historian named C. Van Woodward, and everything that I'm going to read you from this is from, is from, from here. Um, it's about the rise and, crow of Jim, uh, rise and decline of Jim Crow. And what you're looking at here is the number of lynchings in the American South over a 100-year period. It's a remarkable inverted U. Right? It's not that the South got suddenly worse and then better. It's that it rose and then it falls. This is a fact that I guess I'm responsible for, which is the numbers of coincidence of the, of the words Negro and the words murder in the Atlanta Constitution divided by the number of, of times the word January appears is a natural normalizer for this. The pattern looks roughly similar. There's a rise and decline of this stuff. You can use the words Negro and rape at the same time period as well. So there's this clear pattern both in terms of actual slayings of African Americans, but also in these news stories that talk about how bad African Americans are and how dangerous they are. Um, here's the political story that Woodward talks about. Woodward's story is that race suddenly became politically relevant in the 1880s and 1890s. And it starts with the first left-wing party in America that's really about economic redistribution, the populace. Um, okay. The line here is that more important to the success of Southern populism than the combination with the West or with labor was the alliance with African Americans. Populists of other Southern states followed the example of Texas, electing African Americans to their councils and giving them a voice in the party organizations. And down below I have a line from a famous populist par politician named Tom Watson who says, I have no words which can portray my contempt for the white men, Anglo-Saxons, who can knock their knees together and through their chattering teeth and pale lips admit that they are afraid that the Negroes will dominate us. Two things are notable in this quotation from Watson, one of which is he's defending African Americans because they are in fact his natural political allies. He's a redistributor and he's, he's looking out for them. But what's he defending them against? The hate creating stories that says they're a threat. He's defending them against that potential, that potential uh, threat. Um, I'll just read the one quote here. Alarmed by the success that the populists were enjoying with their appeal to the African-American voter, the conservatives themselves raised the cry of Negro domination and white supremacy and enlisted the Negrophobe elements. In Georgia and elsewhere, the propaganda was furthered by a sensational press that played up and headlined current stories of Negro crime, charges of rape and attempted rape, and so on. Okay. Now, of course, this is deeply ironic. Right? One of the two races in the American South has enslaved, murdered, raped each other over the, over the preceding two centuries prior to this. And it's not the African Americans, right? But yet, the, the stories are such that they create this belief that the African Americans are this great threat. And it works, okay? And it works. And the populist forces are beaten back, and they give up on enlisting the African Americans. This is a line from Watson, who by 1906 is himself a racist. Not because he believes it. There's no evidence he believes any of this. But he's decided that his populism won't help blacks. Their blacks are going to be ruled out. They're not going to benefit. So blacks become politically irrelevant because they've just given up on this alliance. And the blacks get, just get put aside. And as a result, there's no more interest to supply this thing, and, and racial hatred dis disappears. It doesn't disappear. Uh, but it, you know, it recedes significantly. Uh, of course, this is not good news for the African Americans. They've been cut off from basic social services for 50 years or 60 years, but at least the lynchings are down. Um, let me talk about uh, 19th century anti-Semitism, and then I'll, then I'll be done. You have to finish at uh, 4.15. Okay. Uh, we'd answer. Uh, uh, 
somebody told me 15 minutes. Uh, or 15, less. You're taking 15 minutes away yep. from me in mid in mid talk. Uh. That's pretty outrageous. Yes. Uh, that's pretty outrageous. Yes. Okay. Um, the, 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 the story here is, is that, let me just give you the story. The, the right, conservative, monarchical, clerical maintained that there must be a place for the church in the public order. The left, democratic, liberal, radical held that there can be no public church at all. Jews therefore su supported the left for obvious reasons. And from Stecker to Hitler, rightists rarely attempted to refute socialism, preferring to cite the high percentage of intellectuals of Jewish origin among socialist publicists as proof of its subversion. Um, the right turned to anti-Semitism because Jews were on one side of the political aisle and they were, it was natural to vilify them. Now, that story works in Russia. It doesn't really work in Austria. It certainly works in France. In France, the right is beaten back by the hating the haters technique. There is no better example of this than Zola's Jacuz, uh, which is a great example of vilifying the, the right wing, calling them a nest, of, uh, a nest of Jesuits prone to inquisitorial and tyrannical methods. Italy and Spain don't have this. And of course, Italy is one of the safest places to be a Jew in the 1930s. Why? Italy certainly, you know, uh, historically, Italy had plenty of anti-Semitism during its point. It certainly had a, had a strong church. Why? Because religion was irrelevant to Italian politics by in 1900, in, in 100 years. Because, in fact, the king himself was excommunicate. The right, the right side of the equation was no longer allied with the church because Pio Nono had, you know, said a plague on all of your houses for taking my land and leaving me a prisoner in the Vatican. So religion is irrelevant. Jews are irrelevant. Jews are safe. So that's, that's at least my story of why, this, why the model predicts why, you know, Padua was a pretty good place to be a, to be a Jew in, 19, in, 1930, in 1935. So I'll end on that, I'll, I'll end on that note. Um, we've got eight minutes left for questions. Eight minutes. Yes, we have to shut down. Okay. Yes, Savite. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Professore parla velocissimamente, quindi ha cercato. Professor Hurz, uh, Glazer has been talking very, very fast. So if you have any questions, that there is some time available. Very little, unfortunately, because we have only have very limited time for your questions. Do please uh, ask for the mic if you want to ask a question. Wait for the mic to be there before you actually voice your question, please. Okay, okay, we can hear. Um, I very much liked your presentation. Um, as a political scientist, uh, however, um, I'm a bit more interested in institutions and process. And as a political theorist, I'm very suspicious of ideas, of concepts like chains of ideas. But I suggest to you there's a, a way of connecting some of the things that you've said that's quite economical. Uh, one of them is to see town-country relations uh, and the role of cities as quite strategic the work of um, Engels at Berkeley and Ed Lutbach shows that uh, in, this, in the great civilizations of the past, and I've written quite a bit about ancient cities, uh, the main distinction was, of course, between nomadic society and sedentary civilization. So cities had lots of functions, and although Plato and Aristotle saw them as uh, primarily market sites, their strategic importance uh, was very important. Uh, they were also sites, I would suggest, not for chains of ideas, but for transactions. And high volumes of economic transactions through trade required people or led to demands for high levels of political transactions and the distribution of political power. And democracy was a series of deals that created this symmetry. But on the question of hatred, cities are mainly the sites for hatred. They're not only the place where stories are generated and distributed, but uh, as all studies of violence have shown, um, whether it's domestic violence or politically motivated violence, contiguity and opportunities for contact are opportunities for conflict. And uh, almost the work of El Elias Canetti, the Romanian Jew on Massen und Macht on crowds and power would confirm this also. There's a question now. I mean, there was a lady here in the front who was asking for the mic. Ah, okay. I really found your presentation very uh, interesting. 
especially because the theory touched some aspects that I hadn't thought of before. Uh, I wanted to ask maybe to bring it a little bit closer to our reality. If you maybe saw, uh, we have this project of building the bridge between Sicily and the rest of Italy, uh, the Stretto di Messina. And I wanted to ask if that's maybe one of the examples where we are trying to invest in an infrastructure in a region where maybe we should invest in universities and human uh, capital instead. Thank you. La domanda, un'altra domanda alla signorina qua. O oh, signora, non so. Lei? In, in your presentation you talked about the role of density um, the, and how important it is for cities to have people that are close to one another because this engages them in you know, sharing knowledge and this is a classic explanation, uh, not just in urban economics, in economics of innovation. But this just assumes that people share knowledge just by proximity, uh, which is somehow a little bit you know, sort of a heavy approximation. And I think in these kind of things, psychology could help economics to understand the dynamics, why is this happening and when. And I think you had a paper in 1999 uh, talking about, you know, asking for more collaboration between economics and psychology to better understand these phenomena. Uh, but I haven't seen much of research following this kind of claiming. I want, just wanted to ask you. You know, Grazie, about this. io direi che dobbiamo fermarci perché sono tre domande e, e, e posso lo, abbiamo i minuti. We have very, very, very little time. And, and I'm grateful for all of them. First of all, I mean, the last thing I wanted to suggest was that cities played this role, uh, were dominated by the role of exchanging ideas historically. They always did play this role. This always did happen in cities. But it's not why cities existed. That was part of my whole point about the story of Chicago, is that was about enabling the goods to be moved over, over space uh, in, in a way that was important, creating markets. And indeed, as you talked about, this is the political city often, which is a strategic military role or some other role, sometimes related to transportation costs. All of this stuff was, was, uh, was absolutely important. Important. So that was, in fact, exactly a point of my talk, was that, in fact, that was, that was true of its historically, but it's much less true today, and these things are much less important today than they were in the past. Uh, it was also brought up that, that uh, there's more crime in cities. I wrote a paper in the Journal of Political Economy in 1999 about that. And it's important to remember that the same proximity that makes it easy to trade with each other or to learn from each other also makes it easier to steal from each other or to kill one another, particularly makes it easier for bacteria to move from human beings to, to human being. Um, this creates a tremendous challenge, of course, for, um, for, for urban governance that then is meant to take, take care of this, that's then meant to address this. And it's, it's why, you know, in some sense, enough land hides all sins, whereas an absence of land makes failures incre incredibly obvious. And it's why we really see the failures of the developing world in their cities, because it's, it's you know, the failure to provide clean water and decent toilets in a place like Mumbai is, is you know, becomes painfully uh, and excruciatingly obvious, and the failure to provide decent policing in Rio de Janeiro is, is likewise uh, enormously painful. Uh, it's not clear to me that there's more hatred in those cities, but there certainly is more, in general, there's more violence uh, because, again, of, of this proximity, because there's somebody, there's somebody to hit uh, that's, that's near you, and certainly it's true that, that the combination of urbanization and racial fractionalization can be dangerous, although it need not be, uh, that we all can think of lots of diverse entrepro cities that have existed for millennia without killing each other. And again, this is a question of where economics has to, has to add uh, on things. Um, on the bridge to Sicily, um, I have not, in fact, studied the cost-benefit analysis of this bridge, uh, and as such, I, I would not be, it would not be appropriate for me to uh, say anything about it. I have long had an interest. I wrote a piece in 1988, uh, is that possible, 1988, on doing business in the Mezzogiorno about uh, Italy's uh, policies that, that favored, uh, favored the South, and I have uh, long wondered about whether or not these uh, are all that sensible. Um, and, but you'd want very clearly for this bridge to be justified on cost-benefit analysis. And certainly, you know, it would be very questionable, I would be very surprised if this were a better investment than, you know, educating our children or the children of Sicily more effectively. I would certainly be very surprised if the cost-benefit analysis worked out that way, but since I have not done it, it would be completely inappropriate for me to uh, actually uh, suggest that, that I know the answer to this. Um, on how exactly learning works in cities and, and psychology and all this other stuff. Uh, for sure. I mean, there's lots of things about the microstructure of learning that are worth knowing about. It's not always obvious that you have to get inside the black box, though. 
it's not always obvious that you need to know all the different ways in which human beings can you know, learn from each other or interact with each other. Often all we need to know is the policy relevant choice and how it, Im you know, what, what the effects that it has rather than actually, it doesn't, doesn't mean that learning more of that stuff isn't vital, but it's not, isn't useful, but it doesn't mean that it's, it doesn't mean that it's vital. Um, and, you know, I think this is another st statement about, I know there's a lot of interest here in behavioral economics. I, there's something that I call Tolstoy's corollary, which is there's only one way to get a problem right, but there are an uncountable number of ways to get it wrong. And uh, we've got a, the problem with the behavioral economics exercise is that choosing which one of those uncountable ways to get it wrong is incredibly hard. My own preference for where to get it wrong is by putting too much emphasis on what people around us say. Okay, that's in fact the, the running model that's gone through all of this, is that we are just you know, too prone to listen to things that people say around us and to take them seriously. Because most of the time when somebody's telling me something like it's raining outside, it's my wife and I should, should go put on a coat, right? Because she's actually transferring information for me that's actually valuable. And that's, that's actually, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a good thing and that's why we don't normally second guess everything. But then entrepreneurs take advantage of that, just as you know, the entrepreneurs of New York's finance system did a lot that was good over the last 40 years, but also did a lot of mischief. Uh, because in fact, that's what entrepreneurs do. They, you know, they try and do make money by by different means possible. Um, but you know, uh, figuring out which one of these errors is the right one to follow on is is I think absolutely uh, on the first order uh, agenda. So, I think we end there. And uh, thank so you all very much for your attention. It was a pity having you just for 90 minutes, yeah. like a soccer yeah. game, yeah. Professor Glaser. Next time, thank you very much, everybody. Grazie a tutti quanti per averci seguito. E un grazie per chi va, Professor Glaser.